What we need what is not more, more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyami. Don't, don't forget, don't forget. What we need what is we not need more medication, more medication but, more but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello, this is Exposé. I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyami. And this is brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. We've been having a conversation around cardiovascular health in general and hypertension in particular. And so far, we have discussed four strategies for preventing and reversing hypertension and other cardiovascular conditions. We've looked at spiritual factors. We've looked at psycho-emotional factors. We've looked at nutritional factors. And we've looked at the restoration of the integrity of our blood vessels. Today we go on to strategy number five. And that is restoring the integrity of our blood. You know, blood flows through the blood vessels. And the integrity of blood determines our heart health, cardiovascular health, and vascular health as well. So what is it about our blood that impacts on our cardiovascular health. There are certain components in our blood that are normal. There are other components in our blood that are not so normal. Or maybe normal when they are in a certain range, then they become abnormal when they exceed that range. Then they start having a negative impact on our cardiovascular health. I'll be highlighting some of those components of blood that can impact on cardiovascular health. The first one that I want to talk about today is your, your, your fasting insulin level. Your fasting insulin level. Not too many people are informed with this particular factor and how it impacts on our cardiovascular health. So today I'll let Dr. Joseph Makola speak to us as I quote directly from him. Listen, he says, any meal or snack high in carbohydrates like fructose and refined grains generates a rapid rise in blood glucose and then insulin to compensate for the rise in blood sugar. The insulin released from eating too many carbs promotes fat and makes it more difficult for your body to shed excess weight and excess fat, particularly around your belly region. This is one of the major contributors to heart disease, according to Dr. Joseph Makola, unquote. There's yet another very profound quote from Dr. Joseph Makola still on the impact on your fasting blood insulin level on your cardiovascular health. And this is what he says, I quote, he says, your fasting insulin level can be determined by a simple, inexpensive blood test. A normal fasting blood insulin level is below 5, but ideally, you will want it below 3. If your insulin level is higher than 3 to 5, the most effective way to optimize, to optimize it is to reduce or eliminate all forms of dietary sugar, particularly fructose, from your diet. That's Dr. Joseph McCullough. So when there is high level of sugar in the blood, you find the body releases a lot of insulin into the blood, and that insulin, even though it does a good job in helping us to manage sugar, to, to let cells absorb sugar for energy, but high sustained level of high insulin in the blood can also cause inflammation and cause damage in the body. That's why your blood insulin level needs to be controlled and regulated to improve your cardiovascular health. And that's why you often see people who are diabetic over the years, down the line, also developing cardiovascular problems. That's because of this situation we're talking about. The second factor in your blood that also needs to be corrected and regulated properly is your fasting blood sugar. Your fasting blood sugar. 
The first one is fasting blood insulin level, which should not be higher than five or ideally three. I mean, I bet many of you have done your medical checkups and they never checked you for your fasting insulin level. Maybe the next time you go for checkup, you can ask your doctor to order for that particular test as well to let you see uh, how vulnerable you may be when it comes to developing cardiovascular problems because of high level of fasting insulin, uh, blood insulin level. So the second one is your blood sugar, your fasting blood sugar. That also impacts on your cardiovascular health. Again, I emphasize, when people have diabetes and they don't address it well, that predisposes them or puts them at higher risk for developing cardiovascular problems as well. Now, again, I'm going to quote Dr. Joseph McCullough. He says, studies have shown that people with a fasting blood sugar level of between 100 and 125 milligrams per deciliter had a nearly 300% higher risk of having coronary heart disease than people with a level below 79. So if you check your fasting blood sugar and it is below 79, then it says your risk for developing coronary heart disease is lower. But when your fasting blood sugar is above 100, uh, up to 125, which some people will describe as pre-diabetes, that increases your risk of developing coronary heart disease by as much as 300%. Now, the third thing in your blood that you need to watch out for and modulate and moderate appropriately is the iron level or ferritin level in your blood. Of course, we all know the importance of iron in our diet and in our body. The body utilizes iron to form hemoglobin to enrich our blood, but too much of iron can also cause damage. In fact, excess or excessive amounts of iron in our body can be hepatoxic. In other words, it can be toxic to the liver. Apart from that, it can also cause other problems, including cardiovascular problems in our system. That's why, again, <laughs> Dr. Joseph McCullough says, and I quote, he says, iron can be a very potent cause of oxidative stress because it generates a lot of free radicals and it can be a cause of oxidative stress. He says, so if you have excess iron levels, you can damage your blood vessels and increase your risk of heart disease. Ideally, you should monitor your ferritin levels and make sure they are not much above 80 nanograms per mil. The simplest way to lower your ferritin level if they are too high is for you to donate blood. <laughs> Go and donate blood. I've seen people who have done their blood work and their PCV is so high, their ferritin level is so high, and they think, oh, wow, this is good. When your PCV, your ferritin level is too high, you need to go and donate blood at a blood bank to save another person's life and to save your own life too. Because when the ferritin level or the amount of iron level in your blood is too high, that is dangerous for your cardiovascular health. So we've looked at fasting insulin level, we've looked at fasting blood sugar, and we have looked at uh, blood ferritin level or iron level. These three components impact on our cardiovascular health. So you need to keep an eye on them to make sure that they don't go out of range so you don't set yourself up for developing congestive heart disease or coronary heart problems or any kind of cardiovascular problem for that matter. Now, as part of restoring the integrity of your blood for proper cardiovascular health, you also need to look at certain other factors. And that includes normalizing your lipid profile. That includes normalizing your homocysteine levels. That includes uh, making sure you have the right viscosity for your blood, not too thick and not too thin. That's avoiding dehydration, normalizing your PCV, oxygenating your blood. All of these define the integrity of your blood. Uh, I'm going to go on a short break right now. And thereafter, I'll be back to now break these things down a little further. Restoring the integrity of your blood. Don't go away. I'll be back shortly.
Welcome back. This is Expose, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akinyemi. Again, let me say to you up front that after we conclude this series on cardiovascular health, I'll be interviewing some experts, and I want you to keep a date with us every Monday, 8 p.m. Nigerian time, on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Help us broadcast it among your friends and colleagues, all your contacts, and let them be aware that something like this is going on. What we need is not more medication, but more education. Now, we are on strategy number five for reversing or preventing cardiovascular diseases and particularly hypertension. And so we are looking at the integrity of the blood as strategy number five. Restore the integrity of your blood. And what do we mean by that? Balance your fasting insulin level by controlling the type of carbohydrates that you consume. Avoid refined carbohydrates such as sugar, soft drinks, even packaged fruit juices. Avoid them. Um, energy drinks, sports drinks, avoid them like a plague. And then number two, your fasting blood sugar also needs to be in the normal range. Number three, your ferritin level or your iron level in your blood also needs to be normalized. And then the fourth thing we are looking at about the integrity of our blood is to normalize your lipid profile. What do we mean by that? Lipid means fat. So lipid profile is talking about your cholesterol, your triglycerides, and so on and so forth. And so you normalize that by eating an appropriate diet, rich in vegetables, particularly vegetable salads. Oats are very good in helping to normalize your cholesterol level. Then vitamin B3, good old niacin, is also very good in normalizing blood vessel. Then you can use supplements like Google, which is G-U-G-G-U-L, not the online Google that you used to search your items on the internet. This is Google. It's a herb. It's a spice. Okay, it's a spice that is just like curry. It's called Google. G-U-G-G-U-L. Okay? And then we have another one called red yeast rice. It's another spice that helps to lower cholesterol. Okay? Uh, there are many, many substances out there. Omega-3 also helps. Coconut oil also helps. And then... You need to normalize your homocysteine level. Uh, I, I encourage you to go and look at some one of our or two of our previous episodes in this series where I discussed cholesterol extensively as well as homocysteine. If you have forgotten what I said, please go back there and refresh your memory. Now you need things like vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and folate or folic acid to help you normalize your homocysteine level so that it does not oxidize your cholesterol and create oxycholesterol. You get folate from your green vegetables. When you eat a lot of vegetable salad and green vegetable smoothies, you get a lot of folate from there. And then thin your blood. Don't let your blood be too thick. If your blood is too thick, then the integrity of your blood has been compromised. But when your blood is of the correct viscosity, then it flows easily. Your heart doesn't have to push hard for blood to go through your blood vessels. Now, with a normal push, it just flows easily because it has the right viscosity. Now, your blood can be too thick when there is too much cholesterol, too much fat, too much triglycerides in your blood. That's why you use blood thinners like garlic, like cayenne pepper, like omega-3 oil, like cinnamon, to make sure these are spices you add to your smoothie. You use it in cooking your soup, in cooking your beans, and various other culinary things that you prepare. That helps your blood viscosity to be normal. So it is not too thick. And then, of course, avoid dehydration. That's part of maintaining the integrity of your blood by drinking sufficient amount of water. People have asked, how much water should I take in a day? Well, very simple. Just calculate your body weight in pounds. If you, if you calculate it in kilograms, just multiply it by 2.2. That will give you your weight in pounds. So if you are, you are 50 kilograms, for example, times 2.2 will give you 110 pounds. Then divide the 110 pounds by 2. That's, um, uh, that gives you 55, okay? And that helps you. That's the amount of uh, uh, mLs of water that you drink at the end of the day. Or on the average, let us say, between 1.5 liters and 2 liters per day. 
for an average adult. That's the amount of water you drink. And you're not supposed to drink that whole 1.5 liters at a go. Just put the bottle to your mouth and gum, 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 gum. First thing in the morning, you gulp one gallon of water. No, not like that. If you do that, in the next one hour, you'll be going to the toilet to wee and wee and wee. Your body doesn't really absorb the water. It doesn't hydrate you. But you drink the water gradually throughout the day. So everybody must have a water bottle, not just children, including adults. All of us must have our water bottle and we must be sipping our water gradually throughout the day. But for those who have uh, urinary problems, you urinate, you urinate a lot through the night when you sleep and that disturbs your sleep, I suggest that you stop drinking fluid as from 4 p.m. so that you will have emptied your, you know, your bowel, your bladder before you go to bed so you wake up not more than twice overnight, probably once, to so wee before morning. So your sleep is not interrupted and that does not elevate your BP again. Because if your sleep is interrupted, again, that can affect your blood pressure. So you have to do something about that. Now, when you drink too much fluid towards the evening, that can make you urinate so many times, you know, through the night. Uh, diabetes can also make people urinate so many times through the night. Urinary bladder infection can also cause urination several times through the night. Prostate problems for men can also make them urinate several times through the night. And then some women who also have very big fibroid or who have had a hysterectomy, they've had surgical removal of their womb and their ovaries and all of that, they can also uh, have some hormonal imbalances that can begin to affect on their urinary frequency. Uh, maybe we'll have a time to look at that in the future, but for now, do your utmost to hydrate properly. And when you, I say hydrate, I don't mean drink coffee, drink tea, drink this, drink that. Of course, uh, tea is okay and what have you, but what I'm saying is that your real uh, beverage is water. That's the real thing you use to hydrate, not all of those other things. And then normalize your PCV. That's part of restoring the integrity of your blood. Your blood must not, your PCV must not be too high and your PCV must not be too low. If it's too low, you are anemic. You need to build up your blood. And if it's too high, go and donate blood. Make sure your PCV is normal. That's part of protecting your cardiovascular health. And then, of course, finally, on the integrity of your blood, make sure your blood is oxygen-rich. Oxygenate your blood. How do you do that? Exercise, regular exercise, deep breathing. Remember your primary school days when they would say, in, out. In, out. And you do that 10 times. You can do that 3 times a day. 10 times in the morning, 10 times in the afternoon, 10 times in the evening. That is how to oxygenate your blood. Deep breathing. But make sure you don't do it by the highway where there's a lot of smoke, you know, and exhaust from vehicles moving. That's very toxic air. You have to look for a pristine environment with fresh air and that's where you do your deep breathing. And I also encourage you to do it outdoors rather than indoors because outdoor air is fresher than indoor air, particularly when you're in a pristine environment. But if you're on the highway, that is not the place to do your deep breathing in the outdoors, all right? And then eat raw food regularly. That's how to oxygenate your blood. And then, of course, when you take green leafy vegetables, you have a lot of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, uh, your body uses it to make hemoglobin, and that helps you to enrich your blood, oxygen-carrying capacity of your blood. Then, of course, omega-3 oil is also regarded as oxygen magnet. Fish oil, flaxseed oil, krill oil, cod liver oil, hemp seed oil, all of these are omega-3 oils. And when you have a lot of omega-3 in your blood, circulating in your blood, it helps your blood to absorb more oxygen from your lungs. That is why omega-3 is called oxygen magnet. And when you have a lot of omega-6, which you get from tilapia and corn oil and all those other white oil, that increases inflammation in your body and that affects the oxygenation of your blood as well. Then, of course, strategy number six for reversing or preventing cardiovascular problems is your internal cleanliness. Detoxify your body. Beginning with kidney cleanse. There are so many things to clean your kidneys. Cucumber is very good in kidney cleansing. All right. Pineapple is also very good. Watermelon is very good. Distilled water is very good. That's why you need a water distiller, water purifier in your kitchen. I recommend the water-wise water -wise products. Waterwise 4000, for example. It's Waterwise 8800, different models. But the least I would recommend is Waterwise 4000. It doesn't mean it costs 4000 naira, but that is the, the model. 
water wise 4000 <laughs> now if you have it in your kitchen it's a countertop device it helps you to purify your water and then you can mineralize your water alkalize your water and um, also structure your water using the, another device called a water revitalizer water revitalizer now these two are worthy investment for your kitchen to ensure uh, kidney cleansing all right then your liver cleanse is also important the cleanliness of your liver is very important when your liver is clean your kidneys are clean and both of them are functioning well then your internal environment your excretory system will be on turbo now when the kidneys are compromised they have a way of pushing up your bp pushing up your creatinine level pushing up your urea level and pushing down your pcv your blood volume so keeping your kidneys and your liver clean is a major strategy for disease prevention particularly hypertension and cardiovascular diseases i'm going to go on yet another short break and when i'm back we will continue this conversation please don't go away i believe you've been having a terrific time with me on expose with tony akiyemi we have great resources that will bless your life available to you on healthy living and many other life subjects we have various platforms where you can obtain material for your blessing. You can obtain some of our work, our books, particularly on Amazon.com. How to Regain and Retain Your Health is a book title that I highly recommend. It's available in digital format, Kindle edition, as well as in printed version. We also have juices and smoothies for healing, health, and pleasure. You can also find these items at another website, familabooks.com, F-A-M-I-L-A books.com. And for those of you who are in Nigeria, you can reach us at the Shepherd Store, 18 Shogunle Street, off Mobilaji Bank Anthony Way, behind FTFS Place, to get our materials. We have over 600 recorded audio CDs, DVDs, VCDs, and MP3s on various subjects. All these things that I teach on Expose are already available in their complete format. How to reverse hypertension naturally, how to reverse diabetes naturally, how to reverse arthritis naturally, and many other wonderful titles. I encourage you to visit this website, Amazon.com, FamilaBooks.com, or CSS Bookstores in Ikeja, Lagos, Nigeria, and you will be blessed reading those materials and sharing them with your friends and family. Thank you once again. God bless you. You're welcome back. And this is Expose brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyemi. I hope this conversation has been meaningful and making sense to you. We're talking about your internal cleanliness as part of your strategy. Indeed, strategy number six in preventing cardiovascular diseases, particularly hypertension, and indeed many other disease conditions. And the first thing we're talking about here is your the health and the cleanliness of your kidneys. When your kidneys are clean and they are healthy and in good shape, they facilitate the excretion or removal of waste products from your body. Because your kidneys are supposed to filter your blood and remove waste products from your blood, formulate it into urine, and then you urinate them out of your system. And when the kidneys are compromised, a lot of toxins are retained in the body, uh, creatinine levels, uh, urea levels, and what have you. And that will also affect your BP because your kidneys are also involved in controlling your blood pressure. So when the kidneys are compromised, your BP starts shooting up. Now, sometimes people ask which one affects the other or which one causes the other. Is it kidney impairment that makes BP to go up? Or is it elevated BP that causes kidney impairment? Well, both ways. It's a vicious cycle. If you have high blood pressure and you don't attend to it correctly, it will impair your kidney, damage your kidney. And when your kidney is damaged, the damaged kidney will also drive up the BP even higher. So you see how vicious that cycle can be. So don't allow BP, your high blood pressure, to damage your kidneys. Because if the kidneys are damaged, then the BP is going up even higher. And the higher it goes, the further damage it continues to cause for the kidneys. So control your BP and also take care of your kidneys. 
Uh, like I said, watermelon is very good in cleaning out your kidneys. And the way to eat your watermelon is not to throw away any part of it. Take the whole watermelon, get a sponge and soap, uh, and give it a thorough wash. Thorough bath. Wash it clean and rinse free flowing water over it long enough. No trace of detergent, no trace of soap, no trace of chemical, nothing, nothing. When you have washed that watermelon very well, preferably organic watermelon, not seedless watermelon. Okay? And then you cut it into pieces with the skin. Don't peel it. Just cut it with the green, the white, the red, the seed, and run it through your juicer to juice it. Juice everything through your juicer. The green on the outside has a lot of chlorophyll inside, which is rich in magnesium and folic acid. The white layer is very rich in minerals. Okay. The red layer is where you have a lot of uh, fructose. And then the seed, which is black, has some essential oils. It has some oils inside and some fat soluble vitamins inside there as well. And so you have a full complement. And when you make that kind of juice, refrigerate it and drink it as part of your uh, beverage. That's a good way to clean your kidney. You can also do the same thing with cucumber. Give it a thorough wash or zucchini. Give it a thorough wash and then cut it with the green outside everything. Make sure it's organic so that you don't have chemicals like pesticides and herbicides and different things on the skin. Wash it thoroughly, clean it thoroughly, then cut it with the skin and juice it. And drink cucumber juice as water. That also helps in cleaning out your kidneys. And then of course there are different uh, supplements that can also be used to clean your kidney. We have a uh, Phylantos Neruri, which is otherwise known as Chanka Piedra, which is also used sometimes even as a stone breaker to break kidney stones. Then your liver cleanse is also very important. There is this um, liver cleansing protocol that I have. If you send me an email, send us an email uh, or put a post on, uh, on any of those platforms where you are watching from and put your email address there and we are going to send you our plan for liver cleanse, liver gallbladder cleanse. You just use grapefruit juice with uh, a, a few other complements. You can do it at home or you can buy ready-made products to use. If you are doing it at home, you just need grapefruit juice, a little lemon juice, orange juice, and then a little bit of ginger and garlic and olive oil. And we'll give you the recipe on how to do it to do a liver cleanse, gallbladder cleanse. If you are buying the protocol that is ready-made, it's a two-day protocol. Just use it for two days. You just get the product. It's called Hydrozone Liver uh, Gallbladder Detox. You just need grapefruit juice to work with it. And in two days, you can get gallstones out of your gallbladder. You can clean out your kidneys, uh, I mean your liver, and that helps you to put you in good step. The another thing you do as part of your detoxification strategy number six is lymphatic drainage. You can get some kind of massage from massage therapists that will help to massage your lymphatic system and do what we call lymphatic drainage to help you drain out waste products accumulating in your lymphatic vessels. And that helps to clean out your internal environment. Perhaps many people are not aware that we actually have two circulatory systems in our body. One is the blood circulatory system and the heart is the pumping machine at the heart of that circulatory system. We have a second circulatory system that is called the lymphatic system. That one has no pumping machine. Your lymphatic fluid moves through your lymphatic vessels uh, and your lymph nodes through movement as you exercise. That's why you sweat a lot when you exercise, particularly on your armpits where you have a lot of concentration of lymph nodes, which is the exit point where all the waste through your lymphatic system get out of your system. So lymphatic drainage with massage therapy, bouncing on trampoline, or using astragalus or echinacea, they help you in lymphatic drainage. You also need colon cleansing to clean your colon. Okay, you can use uh, supplements or you can do hydrotherapy or coffee enema. All of these things help in colonic irrigation and it also helps, coffee enema also helps in liver cleanse and uh, gallbladder cleanse because it helps to stimulate uh, the release of bile through the bile duct from the gallbladder in the liver when you do colonic uh, uh, coffee enema. All right? And then heavy metal detox is also very important. You can also use EDTA. You can use uh, DMSA. You can use sea vegetables like um, um, chlorella, uh, spirulina, uh, blue-green algae, 
uh, modifilan, that's brown seaweed, and then some herbs like cilantro, all of these help in heavy metal removal from the system, and that helps in balancing quite a number of things. Strategy number seven for normalizing your blood pressure, preventing hypertension, reversing hypertension, is what I call cardiomusculoskeletal conditioning. That includes regular moderate exercise to strengthen the heart and improve circulation as well as oxygenation. So you need to have a regular, consistent exercise program. Start small and build up. Don't start doing two hours exercise from day one when you have not been exercising before now. Start from five minutes a day. After one week, increase it to 10 minutes. After one week, increase it to 15 minutes until you can attain a minimum of 30 minutes. And you can do it three to five times a week. If you are older, three times a week is okay. You are in your 60s, in your 70s, in your 80s, three times a week is okay. When you are younger, then five times a week. 30 minutes to one hour of exercise. Brisk walking, swimming, cycling, and so on and so forth. All of these are very wonderful. They help to strengthen the muscle of your heart. They help to improve blood circulation and oxygenation. They also help to improve elimination of waste through sweating. Then attain your ideal body weight and body mass index. That's part of your musculoskeletal conditioning. When you are obese or overweight, that increases your risk for developing cardiovascular diseases, particularly hypertension. So reduce your weight if you're overweight or obese, or gain a little weight if you need to gain a little weight. Just make sure your BMI is okay and your body weight is okay. Uh, then also make sure uh, you can also do things like uh, uh, skin brushing. Skin brushing actually also helps in opening up your blood vessels on the skin and helping to remove waste from your body as well as toning your skin at the end of the day. You can also play games, play squash, play table tennis, play lawn tennis, play golf and all of that. That's part of the exercise regime to tone your body and your fitness. And once your musculoskeletal system is okay, you don't have too much fat in your body, the percentage fat in your body is not excessive, uh, and you are not overweight, you are not obese, you are the average weight for your height, that helps your cardiovascular system a lot. Uh, your waist circumference is important in defining your cardiovascular health. Dr. Joseph Makola said, and I read, visceral fat, the type of fat that collects around your internal organs, is a well-recognized risk factor for heart disease. The simplest way to evaluate your risk here is by simply measuring your waist circumference. Take your circumference around your navel and see how wide it is. The longer your waistline, like they say, the shorter your lifespan. Make sure you lose weight, particularly in the midsection, and that helps you in maintaining good cardiovascular health. I round up and conclude today by talking about factor number eight, which is what I call other factors. Your genetics, your genes, your race, your gender. Again, uh, Dr. P.K. Shah said, genetics is a loaded gun. It is diet and lifestyle that pull the trigger. The fact that you come from a bloodline of people who are hypertensive does not mean you have to be hypertensive. If you change your own diet, your own lifestyle from that of your parents and grandparents, then you are not likely going to come down with the kind of diseases that they came down with. That is the key. You carry the same genetic makeup, but you change your own diet and lifestyle. That will change the equation. That will change the outcome at the end of the day. Very, very important. They also say uh, people of color are more prone to developing hypertension than Caucasians. Well, I don't know about that. Even though that is what scientists will want us to believe, I think it is more of the situation that people of color all over the world have found themselves in. Typically, Caucasians have been known to be more affluent than uh, people of color. People of color are in third world countries for the most part. They are struggling. Even when they take a vacation, they can't go to rest. They still use their vacation to try to make more money to make ends meet. And so they are always under pressure and stress. You see Caucasians, or me, you see people of color who migrate from their country to uh, first world countries, and they are doing three jobs. They don't rest. They move from one job to another job to another job. Why would they not become hypertensive? So is it because of their color? No. It's because of the economic and financial situation that they have found themselves in that is putting them under pressure. 
I believe that may be a contributing factor. Then some of them also eat too much of salt. And then they eat too much of MSG, monosodium glutamate, in the various cubes that they use to cook their soup. You almost can't find a Nigerian kitchen where they don't use those bullion cubes, which is high in MSG. And all those noodle seasonings, high in MSG. We consume a lot of that in this part of the world. People of color do. And I believe those are the factors rather than their race. And then, of course, they also talk about gender. Now, they say males are more prone to cardiovascular diseases than females. Well, that may also be something that is debat debatable. Because, again, you can find out that in a typical setting, in an ideal typical home, you find the woman is the one tending the home front, okay, preparing the meals, taking care of the house, taking care of the children, and all of that. Then the man is out there on the street trying to be the breadwinner. It's under pressure to pay house rent, under pressure to pay children's school fees, under pressure to pay medical bills, under pressure to do this and do that. That is for a responsible man, that is. There are some men that are not that responsible, that their wives are the ones actually doing those responsibilities. Therefore, ideal setting where the man takes his position and is actually doing the needful, what he should do, you see the man, he may not be multitasking per se, like the woman, because women are configured to be able to multitask, really, that's how their brain uh, is wired. But men are not necessarily wired that way to multitask. But the one or two things they are doing is so heavy, they are major, that it weighs them down. And men usually don't talk. Women, when they are having issues, they will talk with their friends, they will talk with their sisters, they will talk, they always vent, they will talk, they will, you know, kind of allow the emotions to ventilate. But men, they will bottle it up. They want to be like they are macho. They are men. They don't. They want. They don't want to be seen as weak. And they but until they balloon and they bust. And so it makes men to develop hypertension and cardiovascular problems more than women. I think it is those socio-economic issues much more rather than the gender. That's my personal take on that. Of course, that is a topic for debate. But that is what they say generally. Now, in concluding, let me say this. If you are utilizing these eight strategies that we've been sharing to transition yourself from your current regime of pharmaceutical drugs to address your high blood pressure and you want to be able to wean yourself off, please do not stop your medication abruptly. If you are currently on medication, don't stop abruptly. Wean yourself gradually working with your healthcare practitioner. That's why the moment you start implementing all these things together, you start taking your checking your BP every day, first thing in the morning when you wake up. Record the date, the time, your blood pressure, your resting pulse. And take notes, track it, journal it, you know, for the next 90 days. And show it to your doctor. That will help your doctor to reduce, you know, the dosage. Maybe you were taking 10 milligrams, they can say, okay, start taking 5 milligrams now. After some time, start taking 2.5 milligrams now. After some time, you don't need it anymore. It's a gradual transition. And then you need to obtain a speak. This is a blood pressure monitor at home so that you can use it to check yourself. The first three months, check daily. Hopefully, at the end of three months, things should have stabilized. Then in the next quarter, following three months, check once a week, maybe every Saturday, maybe every Sunday, maybe every month. Just take one day consistently. Check once a week for another three months. After that, check once a month, maybe the first day of every month or the last day of every month, just to keep an eye, even after you have been weaned off your medication. And after that, then check once a quarter. If you've been a hypertensive before, that's how to gradually transition and monitor your status so that you don't just say, well, I'm now eating salad, I'm now taking smoothie, I'm now exercising. You take all your medication, you drop them well in the dustbin, and then you just carry on. You are not even monitoring. You can put yourself at risk. You can put your life at risk. Please be advised. Work with your healthcare practitioner. Work with those who know and who have been trained to support you and cooperate with every wise counsel that is given. Then monitor. Keep an eye. Do it daily for three months, checking your BP. Then weekly for three months, and then monthly for three months, and thereafter, quarterly for the rest of your life to make sure that everything is still under control. And then before you commence an exercise program, particularly if you are registering in the gym and you want to go through rigorous exercise regime, make sure 
that you can cope. Make sure that you do it gradually from 5 minutes to 30 minutes to 1 hour or probably do a health check first before you start. That way, that helps you not to jeopardize yourself or put yourself at danger. All right. What is the bottom line now? Having shared all these things that can help you to normalize your BP and reverse cardiovascular diseases or prevent cardiovascular diseases. Let's assume that you followed all these things and God has helped you to normalize your BP, normalize your blood sugar, normalize your cholesterol, normalize your weight, normalize everything. And now you are on a jolly ride of good health. And God helps you and you are able to live up to 100 years old before you die or 120 years old before you die. No matter how long you live, no matter how long I live, one day we will still die. And that's the big question I want us to face today. Many people don't want to face that question. No matter how well you live, healthy living principles and blah, 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 all of us will die one of these days. I mean, nobody has lived forever, only God. So, if we are going to die, I think it's important for us to start addressing our minds and our hearts to life after life. What happens to us when we die? It is not if we die, it is when we die. The only people who will not die are those who are born again and are alive when Jesus comes back the second time when the trumpet sounds and they are raptured to meet with Christ in the heavens. But all of us, if Christ tarries, whether we are born again, we are not born again, we will die. The question is, when you die, where will you end up? There are only two places, heaven or hell. There is no middle ground. No middle ground. If the Bible is our authority, there is no middle ground. If you hear any other thing outside of this, it is extra biblical. It is not found in the Bible. In the Bible, the Bible talks about hell and heaven, and everyone will end up in one of the two. I pray for you that you will not end up in hell, that you will end up in heaven. But how do you end up in heaven? It is not by your self-righteousness. It is not by your good works. The Bible says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, said all our righteousness are as filthy rags. There is no righteous man on the face of the earth except those that God has made righteous through Jesus Christ. And that because they repented from their sins and they believed in Jesus Christ and they became born again. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I want you to live long. I want you to enjoy robust health as you live long. I want you to be prosperous as you live long. Enjoy peace on the earth. But when you die, when I die, we need to think about where we are going to. Think about that and pray about it. The way to ensure a place in heaven is to have your name in the book of life. And how do you have your name in the book of life? Be born again. Repent from your sins. Give your heart to Christ. Believe the gospel. Jesus already paid the price. There's nothing else for you to do to merit it. Jesus has paid the price. You just come by faith in repentance and receive God's gift of salvation. If you'd like me to pray with you right now, why not bow your head? Close your eyes and let us pray. Father, I thank you for those who have heard this word, who are surrendering their lives to Christ, receiving him as their Savior, as their Lord. I ask that you forgive their sins, wash them in the blood of the Lamb, and come into their hearts. Be their Lord and their Savior. Give them eternal life. Write their names in the book of life. Empower them by your Spirit and your grace to live for you for the rest of their days. Let the joy of salvation flood their souls. Thank you, precious Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer sincerely, you are a child of God. You are born again. Please write us. Let us know what has happened in your life. We'll be glad to be part of your Christian journey to help you in discipleship, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to learn how to pray, how to study your Bible, how to fellowship with fellow Christians heading in the same direction with the same destiny, heaven, not hell. God bless you. Thank you for your time with us today. We love you and we always appreciate your time with us. Keep a date with us again, same time next week. God bless you.